We're going to introduce Alden Dirks, who very excited to have with us. Um, Alden grew up in close to Kennett Square, Pennsylvania, I believe, which, as you know, is the mushroom capital of the world. So cool, um, but didn't really get into mushrooms until college um, and then went on the journey. I think that a lot of us do from foraging into becoming really excited about, um, you know, the biology aspects. And so um, Alden uh, is an academic mycologist um, who has done a lot of cool work, including um, at Harvard University, um, serving fungi of the Boston Harbor Islands, which I think is so cool. I've like gone by those islands on the ferry to Provincetown a lot of times, and I always wonder what's going on there. Um, and now Alden is at the University of Wisconsin Madison, um, and doing well. I guess is and is now a doctoral candidate. And I, I don't want to say anything more to bungle um, <laughs> the exciting exciting work that Alden is doing. So I will. Uh, just stop and turn it over. Great, thank you, Annie. Yeah, I was at UW Madison um, a few years ago. Currently at University of Michigan, and working with Tim James on some false morels. So that's the talk, the subject of my talk tonight. Can people see my slideshow? Yes. Great, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, well, good evening, everyone. Um, it is spring, spring is sprung, and there it is said that there's two rites of passage of spring. There's finding foraging morels and arguing about the edibility of false morels. So I wish you all luck in finding morels, and tonight we can hopefully not have an argument, but I'll share with you my research for my PhD on gyromitrin. In particular, this is the first chapter of my PhD. It's about the distribution of gyromitrin in the false morel family Dicinaceae. And yeah, excited to share with you. My name is Alden Dirks and I use they or he pronouns. Before we get into this, I would love to share with you an important campaign that's happening in Philadelphia where I currently live. This is uh, around the proposed development of a basketball arena for the 76ers right next door to Chinatown. And in the endeavor to support affordable housing in culturally vibrant cities, I encourage you to learn more about this issue. So Philadelphia Chinatown is a long existing neighborhood that's home to generations of Asian Americans. And it's a vibrant and celebrated part of Philly. If you visited Philadelphia, you may have um, encountered Phil um, Chinatown. And in its history, it's been threatened by numerous development projects. Unfortunately, 25% of Chinatown has been raised for public projects. And right now, a proposed new arena is slated, which is expected to have devastating impacts on Chinatown if it goes through. Speaking to the DC area, there um, a lot of this campaign is also, you know, Washington DC has experienced um, unfortunate gentrification and decline of Chinatown due to the development of an arena. So um, Philadelphia is, is fighting back to oppose this. And I encourage you to check out aaunited.org, Asian Americans United, to donate if you can, and uh, explore online to learn more about this issue. So tonight I'll be sharing with you my research on gyromitrin in the false morales. So let's just jump into that. On the left here, we have a picture of what we call a true morel. This is Morchella americana and the family Morchellaceae. These mushrooms are regarded as delicious delicacies, and many of you might be exploring searching for these mushrooms this spring. On the right, we have what's considered a look-alike, a false morel, also known as lorchal. I prefer that word because I like to call these things not what they are not, but what they are, lorchal. And this is the species Gyrometra escalenta in the sister family Dicinaceae. And in field guides, these are pretty much universally regarded as poisonous, even deadly so, and they should be avoided. Despite that, people eat these mushrooms. In Finland, for example, Gymetra escalenta is eaten as a delicacy. Here you can see big buckets of it being sold. And a lot of people eat this after careful preparation. They boil the mushrooms twice and change the water in between to get rid of the toxin. On the right, we have this uh, species, Gymetra caroliniana, also known as the beefsteak morel. And this is a favorite edible on the Facebook group, False Morales Demystified, which is something of a watering hole on Facebook where people come to talk about the edibility of false morales. 
This mushroom, people do not prepare in any kind of special way. They just fry it up in a lot of butter and people love it. It's some people's absolute favorite mushroom. So what's going on here? Which species have the toxin, which ones don't? This has been a matter of debate for decades. And a few years ago, when my advisor approached me about this potential project and a collaboration, I got excited about being able to spend my PhD research looking for morels in the spring. And I've gotten really excited about this topic of false morels along the way. Um, and this first chapter of trying to figure out exactly which species contain this toxin. So thinking about gyrometry and the mycotoxin more specifically, it is indeed a mycotoxin and it's potent. It's very bad for you and you do not want to be exposed to gyrometrin. Symptoms occur about five to 12 hours after exposure. The common and mild symptoms, I put mild in quotes, just like mild COVID was very unpleasant. You didn't need to go to the hospital, but you didn't want to have it. Mild gyrometrin poisoning includes gastrointestinal distress, vomiting, abdominal pain, and diarrhea. Severe symptoms are much worse. These include neurological symptoms, progressing to seizure. This is because gyrometrin and its, and its breakdown products bind to vitamin B6 or pyridoxine, which inhibits everything from GABA biosynthesis to other things in your nervous system, as well as hepatic coma, death of the liver, or just death in general. And there are thought to be some potential long-term effects Earlier studies using animal, non-human animal models found them to be gyrometrin to be cancerous. And recent studies are finding a potential link between gyrometrin exposure and development of sporadic neurodegenerative diseases like ALS. On the right here, we have a picture of the French Alps where there was identified this cluster of sporadic ALS associated with the consumption of, of Lorchels. So gyrometrin is truly not something you want to be eating. Gyrometrin is a small mycotoxin on top left, we have acetaldehyde, N-methyl, N-formalhydrazone. This is the principal chemical found in the greatest quantities. There's also these eight higher aldehyde homologs that all together compose what we call gyrometrin. Gyrometrin is a reactive mycotoxin, and this explains both how you can eat it after careful preparation, the gyrometrin-containing mushrooms, as well as why uh, gyrometrin is so bad for you. It's a polar, water-soluble, volatile substance, which means that it dissolves in water and it's also readily releases in its gaseous form. Spontaneously at room temperature upon heating and especially in acidic conditions, gyrometrin breaks down into these breakdown products, N-methyl, N-formal hydrazine, and monomethyl hydrazine. Monomethyl hydrazine in particular is known to be very bad for you, to be acutely toxic as well as carcinogenic. I have a little rocket here because monomethyl hydrazine is actually used as a rocket propellant. And it's been studied and, and used a lot in industry and chemical manufacturing, and we know it's very bad for you. So this breakdown product explains how people can eat gyrometrin containing mushrooms after they're boiled and then rinsed in between. However, it's extremely important not to inhale the fumes because the fumes themselves can contain the toxin. And gyrometrin is also a rare mycotoxin. You can see here in this diagram circled the NN bond this makes this an NN bond containing natural product. There's only a few hundred of these known in living organisms, and we don't know what enzymes make this bond in eukaryotes. In general, we have a pretty limited understanding of secondary meta metabolic pathways and genomic arrangements outside of a few model fungi. Here I have a little fun box on the side showing a garotene. This is another N2NP that's found in the common button mushroom. There was some concern about a garotene some decades ago, uh, because of its potential carcinogenic effects. However, it's been found that it's not thought, was not thought to pose any risks to human health given its concentration in Agaricus bisporus. So as I said, there's been for decades people debating which of these Lorchelles you can eat or not. One reason why it's challenging is because there's actually a lot of species in this group and we're far from having a clear understanding of all the species present, for example, in North America. There's about 100 species known in Dysanaceae, and this is a paraphyletic collection of stipitate, discoid, and hypogeous forms. Stipitate means it has a stipe or a stem, like this gyrometra escalenta up top. Uh, discoid means it's cup-shaped or saucer-shaped. A lot of these used to be in the genus Dacina, but this was found to be, there was no relationship, close relationship between discoid forms versus stipitate forms, so now they're kind of all called gyrometra. And then we have the truffles or the subterranean fungi like Hidnotria here. 
Before this study, there are only two known uh, species that produce gyrometrin. This is gyrometrin escalenta, which is where gyrometrin was first isolated from in the 1960s. And this contains 60 to 300 milligrams of gyrometrin per kilogram of fresh mushroom. And then there's this interesting report of gyrometric gigas having less than one milligram of gyrometrin per kilogram of mushroom from this study from 1980. Besides that, there are no other reliable quantitative studies on the presence of gyrometrin in Lorchels. Suspected to contain gyrometrin are other mushrooms in the Escalenta group that um, look pretty much identical, as well as gyrometrin ambigua because of one documented poisoning in the 1970s that shared similarity to gyrometrin poisoning. For people who eat Lorchels, there are some that are regarded as safe. These are the North American gyrometric gigas group mushrooms, as well as the Brunea group. For those who choose not to eat Lorchels, pretty much all species are regarded as poisonous and should not be consumed. Hopefully, we um, some of the data that I share with you today can allow you to make your own opinions about which ones you feel comfortable eating or not, and any decision you make is fine. I want to walk through some of the species you might encounter this spring and going forward. I think these mushrooms are both fascinating, pretty strange looking, kind of iconic. So the first group we have is the Escalenta group. We don't have Gyrometra Escalenta in North America. That's just a European species. Instead, we have Gyrometra splendida and Gyrometra venenata. Splendida is much more common in the Pacific Northwest. In the East, we have a lot more of this Gyrometra venenata. These mushrooms are very toxic. And then we have the infill group. These ones are a bit rare and you find these more so in the fall, actually. And they have more of this inflated look. These are Gyrometra ambigua and infilla, and there's a number of other undescribed species in this clade. And then we have the Gyrometra gigas group. This includes Gyrometra corfii, which is probably the most well-known name, Gyrometra montana, which was previously thought to be just a West Coast species. We now know also occurs in the East. And then Gyrometra americana gigas was a species we recently described that's also found in the East. These are pretty much morphologically indistinguishable. They are three distinct species, um, and they're all found in the East Coast. All three of these are known to be found in Michigan. We're not clear currently what the full distribution of Americana gigas or Montana is. And then finally, we have the Brunea group. <clears throat> these include Gymetra brunea, which I like to call the elephant ear lord chow. It has these almost like cups on a stem that don't quite fuse, and they make this kind of seam. It's a very distinct quality of the species. And then Gymetra caroliniana, the beefsteak lorchel, is a very large species with kind of this reddish-brown folded cap. So the main question going into the study is which dysnaceous species produce gyrometrin? We hypothesize that based on published phylogenetic trees and toxicity evidence, that gyrometrin evolved in the last common ancestor of the Escalenta group and Ambigua group with loss of function in the truffle clade. This fits into my overarching research topic for my PhD, which is the genetics and evolution of gyrometrin. Some of the other questions I'm working on answering are which genes are responsible for gyrometrin biosynthesis and how did gyrometrin evolve in dysanasi? Great, so let's jump into the methods of this study. For this study, we did 105 tests for 66 specimens. These specimens were collections I made myself as well as donations from community scientists, loans from various fungaria and culture collections. These included mushrooms, as well as mycelium, single spore isolate cultures. For each specimen, I sequenced the ITS and LSU ribosomal DNA barcodes and inferred a phylogenetic tree to place gyrometrin distribution in an evolutionary context. I have many more specimens than 66 that are that are um, helping out with ongoing taxonomic studies of this family. This includes a recent description of the species I mentioned, Gymetra americana gigas, and there's many more undescribed species and taxonomic changes that are gonna be made over the next few years. So let's jump in and talk about the assay that we developed to detect gyrometrin. The problem with detecting gyrometrin and its breakdown products is that they're very small. They're water soluble and they are of a low molecular weight. In addition, they lack a UV chromophore, so they do not absorb UV light, which is used typically in chromatograph-based detection assays. We're able to resolve these issues by using this chemical 2,4-dinitrobenzaldehyde, 
when we react to for DMB with the breakdown products, we get these larger shift bases, they're called. And these are larger, they're nonpolar, and they absorb in the UV spectrum. Great. The Here's a diagram of the actual test. We take a mushroom or culture or whatever, we put it in DMB as well as trifluoroacetic acid, those acidic conditions to help release or break down gyrometrin. And then we use ultra high performance liquid chromatography, diode array detector mass spectrometry to detect the derivative products. This is done by in a very simple, simplified diagram. Uh, the extract is put through a chromatogram, the high performance liquid chrom chromatography. It has a non-stationary phase, so it separates out molecules based on their polarity. In this case, nonpolar molecules are slowed down. And then when they come out of the tube, UV light uh, is blasted onto the molecules and then the detector measures the absorbance. So yeah, let's jump into the results. First of all, validating this new assay, here we have the chromatograms. On the x-axis, this shows the retention time. So this is how long it took for a substance to pass through that tube. And you can see here um, the positive control at the top, which is a pure standard of gyrometrin, plus the, react the reagent, DMB, and acid, results in these two strong peaks for the two shift bases around four minutes. And this is looking at particularly an, an absorbance at 370 nanometers. The negative control, which is a mushroom extract of gyrometry venenata on the bottom, is a flat line, as we would expect. When you add DMB, you get two small peaks. And then when you add some acid to that, you get those large characteristic peaks of gyrometry at the four minute mark. And then gyrometry is quantified based on the area of those peaks in relation to a standard curve that was developed with the pure standard. Further validation of this assay showed that over 24 hours, more 12 is converted to 13 as that derivatization reaction, breakdown reaction proceeds. And you can see here the negative control is flat. At zero hours, you have a larger peak of 12, and that progresses to 13 over time. We found that we can detect gyrometrin in really old mushrooms. On the right, we have chromatograms showing mushrooms from various years, on the top from 2003 going down to 1883. So we pulled out a mushroom from the University of Michigan Fungarium from the 19th century. We found that gyrometrin was readily detectable from mushrooms from the early 1900s, early to mid 1900s. And there's even trace amounts detectable from the 1800s. This was really surprising to me, but I helped it helped me understand why this was happening when someone shared that like an herb like basil, when you dry basil, you can still smell those volatiles. And even if after a long time that giant, that the basil has been sitting there, when you bring in a sensitive chemical machine, uh, it can detect those volatiles even after your nose can no longer smell them. But just by drying something doesn't mean that those volatiles are lost completely. Our detection threshold was found to be two milligrams of dry emitrin per kilogram of dry tissue, which amounts to 0.0002%. Great, so I'm gonna jump now into our phylogeny and the results of which species we found to contain the toxin and which ones we did not detect it in. This is a phylogenetic tree, which is red from left to right. All the way at the left, we have the base. And then moving to the right, we can see these branchings, which indicate common ancestors of all the species at the nodes. So species or specimens that are closer together share a more recent common ancestor. And this divides the Dysanaceae family into these few big clades. Uh, specimens that are bolded are ones that are type sequences. So these are used to anchor species names. And then the colors in this phylogeny show which specimens were found to contain gyrometrin, which are in red, and those which were negative in blue. I'm going to talk about each of these subclades separately. And here are some photos showing you what some of these things look like. So at the bottom here, we have the truffles, Hidnotria, as well as Spherospore and Californica, which are somewhat rare species with these really interesting colors and, and fluted stipes, and then Infilin ambigua. If you remember from our hypothesis, based on some poisoning reports, we thought that ambigua would contain gyrometrin. However, we did not detect any gyrometrin in this bottom clade. 
the Infula ambigua group or the truffles in the genus Hypnotria. This middle clade includes Gymetra escalenta and related species, as well as Gymetra anthracobia, which was described only a few years ago from Cyprus. And here we found that every specimen we tested contained gyrometrin, up to 3,000 milligrams of gyrometrin per kilogram of dry tissue. If we assume a 20-fold conversion to fresh weight, this is about 150 milligrams of gyrometrin per kilogram of fresh mushroom. And this is within the expected range for escalenta mushrooms. This is a lot of gyrometrin. You would not want to be exposed to this amount. Finally, moving into this top clade, we have some more familiar species like Gymetra brunei and Caroliniana, as well as the gigas group like Americana gigas, Montana, and Corfii. To our surprise, we, I guess pleasant surprise, we did not detect gyrometrin in any specimens from these clades. However, we did detect gyrometrin in this clade consisting of gyrometra leucosantha. Gyrometra leucosantha is not a very well-documented species. It's not one that anyone would really try to eat, I think. It's a, a yellow cup-shaped fungus, but yeah, we, we had no information whether about whether this would have dry mature or not, so it was a total surprise. Speaking of dry mature leucosantha, it also had this very strong peak that did not correspond to 12 or 13, and this is likely an unknown derivative that could be something related to gyrometrin, but not exactly gyrometrin. So this is going to require some follow-up studies to figure out exactly what chemical produced this unknown peak. Since this study, we have some new data. We found that gyrometrin is also produced by another species in the gyrometrin leucosanthoclade. This is an undescribed species from the Pacific Northwest. <clears throat> we tested more gyrometrin splendida from the Pacific Northwest, and we found that it had similar quantities of the toxin. We also tested gyrometra anthracobia. Uh, a collection was found in Oregon, and that tested negative. We thought it might be positive given its closeness to the escalenta clade. Great. Now let's um, jump into the discussion. And maybe my favorite topic is my opinions on the edibility of these mushrooms. So as a summary, we found that gyrometrin has a limited and discontinuous distribution. It was present in all tested specimens in the Escalenta and Leucosantha groups, and we did not detect gyrometrin in species that are commonly consumed. Based on the phylogeny, there would have to be many loss events <clears throat> of the toxin production to explain its pattern in this tree. So its evolution as a product of inheritance from a common ancestor is less likely, it seems, than a product of horizontal gene transfer. And these second metabolites are both very powerful substances used in the ecology of fungi, but they're also costly to produce. And this results in lots of patterns like this where you have absence of the phenotype <clears throat> and also horizontal transfer of that, of that second metabolite. So talking about um, my opinions on the edibility, I first wanna say that there is no right or wrong answer. My goal here is just to share with you the data as we understand it, all the evidence that we have. And if you're interested in really learning more about this, I encourage you to check out the publication, which can be found by searching my name um, and going to my website, aldendirks.com, where you can download a PDF for free. Um, anyway, so I want to present to you the data as it is without saying whether you should or should not do eat these species. So first of all, with the, with the species that are known to produce gyrometrin, I would recommend that you do not eat these, although the methods exist to, to prepare them so that they do not contain enough gyrometrin to cause acute toxicity. We don't know the long-term effects of being exposed to gyrometrin. And if you have a slip up, if you don't prepare them properly, you can be exposed to very dangerous quantities of the toxin. So gyrometrin escalenta and the leucosantha groups, I recommend do not um, try them. And if you are to try them, absolutely follow the guidelines published by the Finnish Food Safety Authority, for example, on how you properly prepare these to get rid of the toxin. Because again, you do not want to be exposed to gyrometrin. And then we have these lorchelles that are commonly, pretty commonly eaten in North America. So there is a widespread culture of consumption, and they do seem okay. These include the gyrometrin gigas group and the brunea group. Pictured here, we have the five species you might encounter around here. These are Americana gigas, Corfii, Montana, Brunea, and Carolinia. 
For these species, there's no evidence of extraordinary toxicity. I say extraordinary because even commonly eaten mushrooms like morels and oysters can make you sick. They can make you sick because you need to one, positively identify the species. If you think you're eating Dimetra corfii, but you're actually eating Dimetra escalenta, that's no good. You need to collect good mushrooms. They should not be um, degrading. They should be clean and fresh and always cook these mushrooms thoroughly. As a bonus, these are actually many people's favorite mushrooms, including my own, to be honest. Dimetra brunea is extraordinarily delicious, better than morels. However, you must always follow these guidelines when you're eating wild mushrooms to stay safe. Some caveats to these statements, though, is that dimetrin could be present at concentrations below our detection threshold. And this was observed in, as I've said before, European dimetrin gigas at levels less than two milligrams of dimetrin per kilogram of dried fungus. In addition, there could be intraspecific variation in dimetrin production. We only tested seven specimens for these species. We would like to test more. Um, yeah, so that that's the the reality there. Um, it is it is inspiring or encouraging that for the clades that Dimetrin was found in, every single specimen tested contained the toxin. So it, so far, we have no evidence that there is intraspecific variation where within a species, some specimens may produce the toxin and others may not. Um, however. The data right now surely is limited. And really the best evidence we have for these mushrooms being safe is that a lot of people are eating them and there are no reports of poisonings. That all being said, the reality is that there's dozens if not hundreds of unidentified unique compounds produced by Lorchelles. And these are entirely uncharacterized, except for one. This is a molecule called 1,2-hydroxyacetylpyrazole. It's an N2NP. It contains this nitrogen 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 bond observed here. And the authors hypothesized that there could be a reaction, a change in this molecule, and it could break down to form something that was similar to gyrometrin. So we know that this molecule is produced by gyrometra fastigiata. This is a European species that's closely related to gyrometra brunea. So um, this might be a concern to some. However, really, this is the case for all mushrooms. Every mushroom we're eating out in the wild, we have no idea what kind of secondary metabolites they are producing. The, the, chemo, the world of chemodiversity of fungi is, is vast. It's resulted in a lot of amazing drugs, for example, um, but it's largely unexplored. And each mushroom species is producing uh, dozen, a dozen or more of these secondary metabolites with very powerful bioactive properties because they're used in their ecology, either to in competition or for virulence. Um, so it's a rich world of, of chemicals that's really underexplored, and we really don't know much about it at all. So anyway, this is true for Lorchelles, and it's true for all mushrooms that we're eating. Some open questions and ongoing research in this work. The first one is, what are the genes responsible for dimetrin production? This is really the rest of my PhD. I'm attempting to identify the dimetrin genes and then use gene knockout experiments to confirm their role in toxin production. Once we identify the genes, we can look through the genomes of all these Lorchelles. And we, this is another way to determine which species have the potential to produce the toxin. Another question is, do some species that tested negative in the study contain dimetrin at levels below our detection threshold? I would love to test more species with greater detection sensitivity, and this includes European Dimetra gigas. Finally, and this is not something I will be exploring, but hopefully toxicologists can explore this in the future, at levels of two milligrams per kilogram or less, which is what has been found in Dimetra gigas from Europe, what are the potential health impacts, if not acute poisoning? And to be clear, at these levels, if you cook the mushrooms, this is hundreds of thousands of times less uh, of a dose than the estimated human LD50. Obviously, you don't want to be eating quantities of a toxin close to the LD50, but it really is an open question of what the health impacts of consumption of gyrometrin at low levels are, if anything at all. So with that, thank you. Be safe and enjoy the spring. And um, even if you don't eat any of these Lorchelles, they're fascinating mushrooms. I encourage you to learn them and identify them and perhaps even contribute them to your sequencing efforts. We do know that there's a lot of undescribed species 
Um, and we have a, we're very far from understanding the full distribution of Dimetra species anywhere in the world. So honestly, any new sequence you can generate is helpful in this endeavor. I want to remind you to please check out this work being done to oppose the arena in Chinatown, particularly this organization, Asian Americans United. And with that, we have a few minutes and I'd love to answer any questions you may have. That was awesome. Thank you so much, Alden. That, I mean, that was like really a terrific presentation. I should have said um, ahead of time you could put questions in uh, the chat, but you know, since I did not say that, please jump on jump on screen and ask questions or throw them in the chat now. Um, I guess I have a, a question. So <clears throat> you said horizontal transfers, probably how um, they were passing uh, the gyrometrin gene. Um, and I was just wondering, you know, could you give a very brief explanation for people who might not um, know what that is and how it works? Yeah, horizontal gene transfer is what um, really defies all conventions of evolution. Instead of genes being passed down from parents to offspring, you get this movement of genes from either closely related or sometimes even distantly related organisms. This can be from one fungal species to another, from bacteria to fungi or whatever. And this can happen because there are a lot of organisms out there sharing the environment together. And we don't really understand exactly how it happens. It's very difficult to catch it, these organisms in the act of swapping genes. We know with bacteria, bacteria have very, um, they have mechanisms for transferring genes from each other. This is why antibacterial resistance is so common and, and such a problem. One, because there's evolution and selection for resistant strains, but also you can have different bacterial species actually swapping genes with each other that confer resistance to antibiotics. Fungi, we don't know them having such a, a specific mechanism for doing that, but when you're out in the world, it's a leaky place, you might be infected by something. It happens that you can get DNA from the environment into your cell, and if that DNA is useful, it can get incorporated into the genome. Um, so there are increasingly large number of examples of horizontal gene transfer known, and they can confer really great and awesome abilities, useful abilities for fungi. And we're seeing that this is actually a really big part of their evolution. What we don't understand so well right now is exactly the mechanisms for how it happens. But we are starting to appreciate how extensive this horizontal transfer is where a gene for whatever, producing a resistance protein or producing a toxin is moved around. And some well-known examples are psilocybin. Psilocybin has been horizontally transferred to a number of different um, clades and amatoxins. You can find amatoxins in Gallerina species and Amanita species, and they did not acquire the ability to produce amatoxins from um, a common ancestor, rather, by horizontally transferring those genes from distantly related species. So it happens quite a bit, especially with secondary metabolites. Thank you, that was a beautiful explanation. Um, Chris asked, um, do, do Verpa species contain gyrometrin? And also maybe, I think, uh, well, I don't know if elf saddles is also named for Verpa or for Helvella, um, but. Yeah, I think I'll, uh, that's typically used more for Helvella. So I ventured a little bit at the beginning of sampling these other genera, but I quickly limited my scope to gyrometria just because there's you could branch out as far as you wanted to. Uh, there's no evidence, but there's also no testing um, for those species. And as far as I'm aware, there's no like talk. I don't, I'm not aware of poisoning events, really associated with those, at least ones that would have symptoms related to gyrometry. So I think we don't know right now which the full extent of gyrometry production, um, but based on, I guess, toxicology evidence, I would not think that verpas or Helvellas contain gyrometry, but you know, they could, they could contain uh, any number of other toxins potentially uncharacterized uh, yeah, lots of chemodiversity, and these things evolve very quickly as well. So the further you get away from a particular group, they might have an, a related toxin, but not exactly gyrometrin. 
Thank you. That's that's great. Well, we I bet we have more questions, but maybe people can email them to me and I can pass them on to Alden. Thank you so much. That was terrific. We'll definitely be having you back for more talks um, 